grace and peace to you in Jesus Christ. It is wonderful to be here. As David said, this is my, this is my third attempt to get here. My first attempt was, uh, was in 1991. In the spring of 91, we were, I was part of the CNBC Singers uh, Choir Tour, and we were coming down from Winnipeg uh, on a bus, and we were in one of those Canadian spring snowstorms in May, and the bus came around the corner, and the back end of the bus swung out in the slush, and a sideswiped a car from one of the different, one of the, the other Christian college of all things, and, which created a huge political firestorm. That, our, that the CMU, CNBC bus knocked the other car off. So anyway, it um, <clears throat> was very difficult. Anyway, until we, we got everything all sorted out, it, we had to knock EMBS off the trip and go straight to Leamington. So that was the first attempt. The second attempt was in 1995. I had finished my first three years in ministry in St. Catharines. I wanted to go on to some further study and then do my final year of an MDiv at EMBS. But the housing market in St. Catharines crash when General Motors uh, announced the layoff. <clears throat> so we sold our house for a lower value than we bought it for. We lost all of our savings for, for school. And then that's why we went straight to Manitoba where I started to work. The third attempt was with David Beauchard's inauguration. And in, uh, in April of 2020, we were going to be coming here and we had the tickets purchased and everything. So we couldn't come, so I, I was, as I was preparing, and I was at the airport yesterday thinking, okay, I'm waiting for the lightning strike, something, <laughs> something's going something's to prevent this, I'm not going to get there, but uh, last night I did show up at about 11.30, so that was, we made it, and I'm here, and thankful. This, this place has some deep family history uh, for us on, on my wife Rose's side, um, her, um, her uncle is uh, Dr. Henry Potter, who was... <clears throat> who was uh, president here for a while, and excuse me, <clears throat> and my wife's father, Peter Rusloff, uh, built the concrete benches in the courtyard when he was studying here and was also the maintenance man here at the time. So I've always wanted to get back here, and my wife Rose was born in Kendallville, Indiana, when they were students here. So, so it's a bit of a so she's kind of Rose is very jealous that I'm not that she's not here today along with me. Maybe next time. <clears throat> So as, as David said, I was, I was 28 years in, in pastoral ministry, the last four and a half years now in administration, uh, where I've been working. And during, a, during my time in ministry, along with Ed and Gay Kaufman, uh, were there part of that time, I did a lot of thinking around, around Christian education. And part of that was is because I was on the Metal Simons Christian School board, which was a K-9 to school. And I was on the board, and I was representing the three, excuse me, <clears throat> the three Mennonite churches that helped establish that school. So they would look to me for input around what is, how do these two work together? How does ecclesiology work together with, 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 with elementary academics and such? And so I did a fair bit of reading, a lot by people who were in this room and, and by, by some of their parents and, and books that were edited here and other things. So I did a fair bit of reading. And uh, I want to say at the outset that I'm not an academic. And so I don't pretend to say things and write things like some of you have and some of your parents have and such. So <clears throat> I'm, it's not my wheelhouse. And so I, I would rather like to come to the question around how the schools and how the church, uh, the church broader work together from a bit of a different angle. Uh, as David mentioned, I grew up playing hockey, so I assume my children would want to play hockey or ringette or some other thing like that. Uh, I hadn't ever considered the sport of volleyball because I could barely jump over my hockey stick. <clears throat> and Rose didn't play volleyball either. But at Mental Simons Christian School, there was a woman named Bev Weins. And Bev was a, um, this vivacious, loving, kind of your favorite grandmother, kind of hug any kid that would come up to you for, was that kind of a person. And she was teaching grade five, but she also taught volley the volleyball team. She coached the volleyball teams after school. And she herself had played university volleyball. <clears throat> and so when our oldest daughter, Danielle, who was in grade seven, made the junior team, tried out and made it, um, <clears throat> our younger two kids would stick around for the practices because the practices were after school. They would stick around and, uh, and just watch, or so we thought. Well, one day I came to pick him up at 4.30, and there was Danielle and her team doing some practice play. 
and the assistant coach was running that. And there was Bev over in the corner with Jenna and Levi, in grade, who Jenna, who was grade four, and Levi in grade one, teaching them the basics of the game, how to pass properly, how to position your feet, how to square your shoulders, and then how to set the ball and such. And she was over there. And this just didn't happen once. It happened weekly, <clears throat> whenever they would practice. And over the months and the subsequent years, the two younger ones in particular took a real interest in the game. And they were recruited to volleyball teams um, <clears throat> and coached by former professionals and also Olympians uh, who, who, uh, who uh, came to coach them. And, and so um, Jana also diversified into beach volleyball and went on to uh, national championships as well. And for a while, this picture was on the front of the, of the uh, Volleyball Canada's National Beach Volleyball website. This is our daughter, Jana. And this is her here playing against her two teammates on the other side of the net. And she, had, she wanted to play and her other partner couldn't come. So the, the young woman in the very back corner here is <clears throat> 16 years old who she just picked up at a practice two weeks before and they came out and they came silver medalists uh, in, in beach volleyball nationals in Canada. <clears throat> and, this is, and then this is our, our son Levi is in the red shirt <clears throat> there. He's average height, he's five foot 10. <laughs> so he obviously plays libero for the team. There's, there's guys who's only, you can only see his left hand in the picture, but the guy whose left hand, I'm sorry the picture's blurry, uh, he, he uh, can jump, his vertical is so high, he can jump and touch the top of a basketball backboard. That's how big these kids are and how they can play. Well, Levi was, this, Levi, uh, was coached uh, all the way through um, by some really high-level people, ones that spoke into his, into his life. And, um, and I, got to thinking to, uh, my, I got to thinking to myself, you know, through all the years they played, uh, our daughter Jana and our, and our son Levi, if you would ask the top leaders in Volleyball Canada, who are the 15, 30, 40 kids, the top kids who are coming through our system, some of whom will be heading to the Olympics, the top leaders in Volleyball Canada would have been able to name many of them. That's the way the system was oriented. <clears throat> so, the, so the top leaders would come to watch these teams play. They'd come to watch this. They'd say, what's this little kid doing out here on the court with these big guys? And, but when he'd come off the court, he's actually looking him in the eyes. And, and so, and I'm not, I'm not telling you this to brag about my children. I, I'm, that's not at all my point, I, I'm, though I'm proud of them. Um, I'm telling you this because one day I was sitting in the bleachers, and there was Don Saxton, who was six foot eight, used to play for the Los Angeles, uh, the Canadian volleyball team in Los Angeles in 84. Uh, Don was sitting beside Levi, who at that point was only about five foot five, and they were sitting together, this huge, huge man, beside this little guy. And, and, um, and Don was talking to Levi about the giftedness he saw in him the way he played the game and speaking into his life. And I thought to myself as I was watching this, I thought, you know what? Volleyball Canada is run by mostly volunteers. It's a volunteer-run organization. These coaches get honorariums that are minimal. They pay gas money. They spend evenings and weekends with these kids, often three times a week, and, and, trying to, and when they go on tournaments, trying to keep these kids in the right rooms, you know, and pulling these kids off the court after they've made a really bad play that everybody saw, you know, or talking th with them through a really tough loss when things went bad. And there I am in the bleachers, and just something dawned on me, and my, my brain makes weird connections at times, but something dawned on me when I was watching this, and I thought to myself, you know, the second tenant of H.S. Bender's uh, Anabaptist vision is voluntary association. And I thought, I was serving in a congregation of roughly 350 people. Only three of us were not volunteers. There was two pastors and a part-time admin person. The rest were all volunteers. And I asked myself, is any of the mentoring we're doing in the church comparable to this? And how is it that a volunteer organization like Volleyball Canada 
<clears throat> mentoring is done so sincerely and so deliberately by so many. And it's just a game. It's just a game. And how can it be such that they're dedicating three times a week, sometimes 6.30 in the morning, and, and <clears throat> it's just a game. And here we are in the church and, and focusing on nothing less than God's plan for the redemption of all things in the world and our participation with that, and we're struggling at the most basic level. What, what, what has happened to our compelling vision and, and what has happened to our belief in the incarnation of, of God as God's way through glory and beauty to save the world? And, um, and I know, I mean, I was just in a class where these questions were explored this morning. Right? I know they're explored here. And I can get lost in questions like this. And I, I just get, I'm far too pragmatic for it, which is a, <clears throat> a positive and a negative. <clears throat> but, um, but I go back to volleyball and I go back to my home congregation who is probably the best I have ever seen at scouting. And I grew up at Vineland United Mennonite Church in, in Vineland, Ontario. And Vineland had its problems. Some of them were really big. <clears throat> but from the period of the 19, early 1970s to the early 1990s, there were over a dozen people, and I say it this way, delivered to Canadian Mennonite University, handed over to Mennonite University for education, and many of them ended up here, and then, serve, and then served in the church years and years after that. And in Vineland, it was very common to have the Don Saxons sitting on the bench beside young players, quote-unquote, speaking into their lives and calling them to what they, calling out the gifts they saw in them for, for service in the church. And I sincerely think that the ongoing relationship between church and school will reflect the level of energy and dedication we have in regard to scouting and mentoring young leaders in local congregations. In fact, I've even stated it more boldly, and I was quoted without my permission at, at a workshop one time, although that's fine, <clears throat> where I said, my, I, my, I was quoted as saying, if you're not mentoring someone, you're not leading. And, and, uh, and I, have, I, have, I know I've thought that that's an overstatement of times, but I, sometimes I don't know if, I don't think it is. I think of how many biblical examples are this, you know, Eli and Samuel, Elizabeth and Mary, Paul and Timothy, just go through all these different ones. And it isn't just the young people. When I was, when I was pastoring in Calgary, a man about my age got laid off from his job, and he had a decent severance package, but decided to take on church custodian work for, just for some bread and milk money. And one day, I went up to the church library. I was wanting, we had Willard Swartley come recently, to our church, and we, he left us with a copy of Covenant of Peace, his thick book, his thick book. And I went up, I didn't have myself, so I went up to the church library and took it out, and I went to sign my name, and here's the name of the church custodian in the front of this book. <clears throat> so the next day when he came in, I said to him, hey, uh, do you read this stuff? And he said, yeah. I said, do you enjoy reading this stuff? And he said, he said yeah, I actually do. And I said, do you, ever, uh, do you ever thought of trying your hand at preaching at all? And he said, well, I, I don't know. I said, well, we'd work at it together. We'd, you know, we'd, we'd sit down and we would build a sermon together and this, and we'd practice it and this kind of thing. And, <clears throat> and so he did, and, and we did, and, and he was pretty good. He was pretty engaging, and the congregation had a really learning posture with him, and and well, over time, after two or three sermons, he was on his own, and he became one of our lay preachers. He loved to study and read. Well, you know, that fall, he later wound up here at AMBS. And it wasn't even us inviting him to go. He said he wanted to come. And soon after he graduated, he wound up uh, pastoring at a church in Low Farm, Manitoba, where he still is. His name was Doug Unrell. Some of you might remember him. And so we were. I, when I began my role, I was... I was going to meet with the pastors of the Western Cluster where he works, and many of the pastors didn't know that we knew each other. And so when I came in and introduced myself, I said, you know, when I have a Sunday morning free, I'm happy to come preach in your congregation. And I said, you know, I said, it's built into my budget. There's no honorarium or mileage, or, uh, mileage payment needed. So I said, for those of you in rural churches where some things are tight, it's, you know, it's a, it can be a bit of a relief for you. 
Well, Doug fires back. They didn't know that we knew each other, and he said his comment was, well, you get what you pay for. <laughs> <laughs> and they looked over at him and said, what are you doing? <laughs> but, but we... It was, it was great, we had, a, we had a really good back and forth, but, but, I, but, that's, so, but, but there's a situation where I just happened to notice somebody signed out a card. You know, and, we, and over the course of time then, at Foothills, we, we have had three young African students come to do a pastoral internship with us at Foothills, where they kind of learned, found their feet and things, and, so both of them are, two of the three are back pastoring now in Africa. And I wonder about this idea, maybe this is a question I would love to engage you on. What would it look like if some of the, and myself included, this is myself included, some of the top leaders in our denomination would focus ourselves around scouting leadership. And scouting leadership, and our pastors would focus around scouting leadership and mentoring so we could find out, kind of like Volleyball Canada does, who are these people that are in our midst, who, the giftedness that's there, and how are we finding them? And then delivering them or, or together with our, our schools and the seminary, getting them here. And that's just not just young people. That's also people who finished a 30-year teaching career who probably, would, if they've been a principal, they would be a really good interim because they know how to mediate conflict. You know, or these things. How do we find these people who are mid-career or career-switching or young people <clears throat> and scout them, mentor them, get them in a place where they can be in a place like this to learn, and then continue on in service of the church. I'd love to engage you on that. I was part of a young adult group uh, led by Glendon Clausen of years ago, some might remember him. This is back in 1993 when, <clears throat> when the Commission on Overseas Missions still worked in pretty closely with uh, Columbia. And we were taken as a group of youth pastors and conference youth pastors to go to Columbia, where I met young Andrew at that time, who was about 15, 16, 17 years old. And we got into this context, and I, we were sitting in the home of Jack and Irene, Andrew's parents, and they were talking away. Jack was talking about his favorite topic, the church. And we, we were beginning to talk, and all of a sudden, kaboom! And the building shook, and, and uh, we, Jack kept talking. And we kind of were looking around at each other, and pretty soon Jack realized that we weren't looking at him anymore. And he stopped what he was saying. He says, oh, that was probably just a bomb going off at the university across the street. But as I was saying, and then he went, <laughs> and then he went back. And I, and I thought, what, what is with people who would come and work in a place like this? There were, there was on average 16 murders a day in Bogota. Why would they be here? And it was in those places that I, as a mid-20s person, thought, wow, there is something deeply compelling about this message. And would I be here without that experience? I don't know, but that's one. I've wondered about these experiences for youth, young adults, for other places, for other people. Thanks for that story, Danny. 
I, I reflect on the. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Brent's going to hold it for me. That's lovely. <laughs> Thanks, Brent. <laughs> um, I think I think like I love this idea of scouting. And I think there's, there's, some, there's some beauty in it when, when a mentor speaks to a younger person or, or not so young. One of the things about younger people is that, you know, my sense of middle class Canadians and Americans in the Mennonite world is that, and probably other denominations too, is that the parents are not <laughs> really welcome to their, parent, to their children becoming pastors, right? I mean, it's not like engineering yeah. where there's more money um, and it's not like some other like some other <clears throat> professions that have that have some status or something like that. And I think um, another one is that we're we're more and more aware of how hard it is to be a pastor, and how pastors have been burned by congregations. So it's it's th that's one of my issues, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's like. Youth <coughs> pastors will say it's, the youth are great. It's their parents that are hard working, <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, and that's really quite true often. Yeah. And this is the same kind of thing. It's like yes, here here are some people that have some great potential for being in the church uh, as pastors or lay people uh, or trained lay people, whatever. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it's the parents. We're working against the parents sometimes. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think uh, back to the class this morning, I think uh, part of our task as the church is to rec recover that compelling vision uh, of, of uh, you know, it's through the church that the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to the world. There is no plan B. Like, this is it. Uh, that is part of it. And to get us back on track from, from the other fights that seem, we seem to get caught in around ethics or things like that. <clears throat> I think also with the way church expression is going, like we're still coming out of a, in North American wise, a very modernist way of understanding and being the church. And I think as that, as that begins to transform and we find our way, I, I don't know, I think more and more we'll be, we'll be heading for, for situations where we have persons who are chemical engineers who also have theod theology on the side and who are taking a night course and doing this, right? I, I think of uh, one of the best mentors that is in the Vineland church in the Vineland area is uh, Tom Newfold, and my nephew was with him uh, working on his farm. He hires these young farm kids, and so they're working away and they're they're picking green beans for the because they go to market twice a week. <clears throat> Out of the blue, he says to him, "So Riley, what do you do with the parable of the unjust judge?" <laughs> he said, "Is that illogical or what? Like, how do you understand that?" And they go back and forth on this. Well, first of all, so can you tell me the parable again, right? Then they go back and forth. And they talk about these things. And they talk about the role of the church in the world. And, and it's just all done going about normal things. It's not, clo not, not locked in a classroom, but it's about being, doing, picking beans and doing other things and around tables. Seems to me that's what, G what Jesus did a lot, right? I think, I think more and more um, we're shifting toward that model where we're going to see more young adults who have professional careers, middle, middle class or upper class, uh, professional careers who might do some work on the side. But I, I think the bigger part of it is, yeah, we've got a ton of work to do within our denominations to sort out what we're, what we're really doing there. Like it's, and, I, and I say this at the, at the nationwide level too, I've said it in reports, I've been quoted as saying it in the Canadian Mennonite, which maybe I shouldn't have done that, but I said to, maybe I said too, too often to, we're, we're, um, we're straining out the gnats and we're swallowing camels. And, and I said we're, we're, com we're completely missing any opportunity to have input into where, where things are going because we're straining out gnats over here. And so, and so, um, yeah, as much as we can, it's, it, it, I, I think um, I had a friend who recently said, um, you know, they asked, was asked, how, how, qu how quick will the kingdom of God come? And he says, it comes at the speed of surrender. Wow. And I thought, huh, yeah, it's surrendering to this, not fighting over it, but surrendering, yeah. Is there a Mennonite Mission Network and an alum of AMBS? Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you speak. You spoke, and uh, to the areas that I'm very interested in. 
as far as leadership development and organizational development is concerned. Now, I have a question. Do you see a relationship between mentorship and succession planning? What I've seen in our work in Africa are leaders who refuse to leave. Interesting. And when they leave, it's because we have to bury them. Uh, and not much work being done um, in baton handover and making sure that everybody is actually affirmed from within an embedded attitude that says, you can be great for God to everyone. Yeah. What's the relationship there, in your opinion? Boy, that's a great question. In our, in our polity documents, we're very clear when a, when a pastor leaves a role, they leave the congregation and they, they move, uh, not everybody follows that, but they leave the congregation. <laughs> Ed, dealt, Ed dealt with some challenges in some of his ministry, but, but as they leave the congregation and they step back, but the problem is you have, at least some in our settings, you get these people with an immense amount of wisdom and knowledge that are just kind of put on a shelf. There's no, there's no place for, for us to draw on them other than through informal contacts, which can be hit and miss, right? And I, and I, I know, I, I can't speak of the African setting very much. I, I know enough, just enough about it to probably get it wrong. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, how do, we, how do we find spaces for what I would call these emeriti or emeritus people to be able to kind of give their wisdom to the church uh, and, and share it in a, in a way of consulting and or, or in a way of, um, in, in a way of uh, helping to inform but not necessarily control the, the outcomes of the decisions. And in, in our setting, it's, it's probably a bit more, it's a bit, can be a bit more clear and our polity makes it very clear. But I think we have lost something when some of the, and I, and I talk to some of these people because I will, I will go back and I'll talk to some of these folks and say, hey, can I, uh, can I meet you for coffee? I need to talk to you about some stuff that, how was this back then and how do you see it now? And, he's, and the comment always is, thanks for asking. Many don't ask anymore. And I just think, oh, this is not right. So yeah, if we, that's a, if we can find a way to work at that, that would be, be really helpful. And I'm sorry, I don't have many good answers on that. Hello, thanks so much for coming. My name is Isaiah Friesen. Um, I, I don't have exactly a fully formed question, but I'm struck by your emphasis on the compelling vision that brings volunteers to Volleyball Canada. And I'm thinking about the tension between the tradition of volunteering and also the need for economic justice for church workers, both in the North American context, especially for people my age, I'm 28, mm -hmm. um, struggling with how we're going to survive economically in the places that we want to serve the church and also for people you know around the world who come from very different economic contexts um also needing to survive and, and be paid fairly for giving their lives to the church so i don't have a question about i mean i do i'm wondering about it and i wonder what you would like to say about it that's yeah. oh that's that's really good i mean i mean part of it with compensation packages, you know, and how we deal with these things. And you enter it as soon as you, I mean, I, I don't know how it is in the U.S., but in Canada, there's pretty strict, strict, um, um, pretty strict rules around co contractual. Um, we, we used to have memos of understanding, but they're now employment contracts and how you work at this and, and, and such. And, and boy, the pastor's salaries uh, have not kept pace with what would be equivalent in other professions that would demand this much of a level of knowledge or other things. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a constant challenge. Um, I wasn't some of the, one of the early ones who, who went into ministry and some of the very first paid pastors were like, okay, you, we're paying you, your work, this is what you work for us now. And it was, it was brutal to be an employee back then. It was brutal. The salary was terrible and you worked 24 seven. In fact, the church I served in St. Catharines the pastor used to have to wash his car on Monday night in the dark 
because people thought he shouldn't really be taking Monday off, so he didn't, so he worked seven days a week, but thought he would, would wash his car Monday evening at least, so he could do that. So there was this kind of stuff, right? But yeah, that, that is, you know, uh, with um, economic justice for younger, for younger adults entering, the chur entering church work, and I would say also safeguards within the church, within that, like in terms of, I don't like the words human resources, because uh, that's, that's, uh, I don't like to view human beings as resources, but I, and I know it means different, but, but, <clears throat> but, but how do we understand that in a way where, where we can try to ensure a safe working environment for people, because there's, when there's conflict in the church, it's usually the sights are set toward the person who's on staff, right? Just like in a conference where there's conflict, it's usually the church camp that's gonna get it, right? And so, right, so, but, but yeah, these, these are tensions, and I think more and more churches are saying, boy, we just can't afford this, or, or we can only afford, afford a, a point four or something like that, which wouldn't get you to the, to the level of a benefits package, right? So you're living hand to mouth, you know, uh, this, that's a that's a challenge for the church to face, uh, and in, in in terms of the ethics around that, I'm sorry, I don't have a well formed answer on that. Sorry, thank you. Um, I heard my sister Sibo Nokushle ask a somewhat different question than what you answered, and I'm uh. interested in your response to what I my interpretation of the question. Okay. So, I'm going to reframe it, if yeah, I may, yeah. because I appreciate what you're saying. Um, and that is, what is your um, recommendation when um, we're working in communities where there's a, a person in a position of power that is doing great work, perhaps, but seems reticent to give someone else a turn to provide okay. leadership? Yeah. Um, so I wonder, it, within this, um, this impetus to cultivate, to, to mentor, and to cultivate um, leaders. Th thank, thanks for refocusing that. I, I took off on a tangent of what you said, but that was, that was very helpful. <clears throat> I think my first, I uh, have worked at a couple of these situations, um, and I gotta be real careful. Um, I, <laughs> um, back, back to what I said earlier, um, the, the thing I've been quoted around of, if you're not mentoring, you're not leading. And, and I, would, I would begin to, I, I, would, I think we need to be talking with leaders uh, who are not mentoring people into roles to say that maybe what you're doing, and, and I know this can sound pretty harsh, maybe what you're doing is not actually leadership if you're not mentoring anymore. I, some of this I, I, I learned from early on and when I left the congregation I was at Foothills, we, we made it a point of having minimum 12 people who could preach in the congregation and carry a worship service. So when I go on sabbatical, they didn't even have to get guest speakers in. But that was a culture of the congregation where they expected that. And I was behind a lot of sermon writing, but it was never seen. <clears throat> but I think, yeah, that's kind of where, uh, where angels fear to tread is going after some strong leaders who are, who are really good and very influential, but maybe it's a matter of opening up a, a, a different, a different uh, picture of what success looks like. And, 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 and what, um, there, was, there was a book that came out by the, um, the Alban Institute some years ago that I read called Growing in Authority, Relinquishing Control. Yeah, that was a very helpful book too. And I think, how, how can we, how can a leader, how can a leader grow or even maintain their sense of authority but not have control and, and, and keep calling forward younger people and not necessarily younger and other people to, to because one, one legged pedestals are really volatile. You know, the one legged stool, I mean, is really volatile. You have a stool that has 15 legs, boy, it can, it can take a lot. But, yeah, like a lot of it's contextual, I know, but, it, but it's, um, thank you, yeah. Thank you, Doug, for coming. My name is Ndunge Sefu. Um, I, I really like the, the, the illustration of the volleyball club and the, the, the basketball and how the, the, the volunteers 
in that group trying to spot the next leaders and mm. the team. I think one thing about that illustration is that the volunteers or the coaches are not looking first of all for who are around them, who they know specifically and connected to. So they're spotting the, the, the skills and the talent. Uh, if I want to bring it to church and coming from the Congo, South Africa, mm. uh, perhaps the challenge in those areas is that the leaders perhaps see the next talent near the tree, near, near where they are, in the families, in the clan. Oh, How do we yeah. know? How is this person connected to? Uh, that's perhaps not a Mennonite well-known name. And so it creates, uh, I'm saying create perhaps the idea to the younger that that's part of that area of leadership it belongs to a certain class to a certain ah. group of people it's not really our thing and so we can find our ways elsewhere where we can be well off and leave that to others and so uh, the next generations of leaders are shrinking and shrinking and shrinking perhaps because the connections yeah. are limited into a certain sense. How do we help that? Oh, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's almost the opposite problem we have here where, you know, yeah, I, I don't pretend to know how to understand those family systems or, 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 or tribal, tribal pieces well enough to know that. Um, but through my, through my time, my little glimpses of time with Africa Intermediate Mission uh, and some of the partnership council meetings that I've gone to, I, I have heard those stories, right? I've heard those stories and they're difficult. They're really difficult. And I honestly don't know how to answer that. Um, I, yeah, I think anything I would volunteer probably would be, who is this guy to say this, to give this kind of an answer? Because I really don't, I really don't know. But thank you for that though. That's, that's that, that, that's a very different context than, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks, for your attention and engagement. Thank you. Thank you.